And uh, good morning to Dr. Crow and uh, good evening to our doctors down under in New Zealand, uh, Dr. McLaren Chapman and Allcroft. And uh, I would like to say from the outset, uh, this has been a very kind of informative um, session. And we have kind of, I suppose, looked at the template in Australia and New Zealand and um, them, them, them different, I suppose, compartments around assisted dying have been in kind of evolution the last four to five years. In, in New Zealand's case, it's been a, by a popular vote uh, where the majority of people in New Zealand supported uh, legislation around assisted dying. And obviously we're having this discussion uh, and debate uh, in this country and obviously the kind of the vanguard of I suppose that this debate at the moment has is in this committee and it's coming to a conclusion relatively soon and we're kind of uh, drawing up kind of parameters and possibilities around assisted dying uh, where it can be legislated for. I as one hope uh, that assisted dying can be legislated for and that this uh, committee uh, supports legislation. Um, and I think one of the templates that I think we should look at is the New Zealand and Australia model in terms of those that can avail of assisted in dying uh, and those that can't. I think that's very important because there's a lot of scaremongering around um, this issue. But uh, general opinion, not only in Britain and Ireland, the majority of people support legislative change when you put all the facts on, on the table. Just in terms of um, Dr. Um, McLaren, just in terms of if somebody wants to uh, avail of voluntary assisted dying, could you kind of bring us through the process? So do they contact their GP and then via the GP, they, you know, that kind of starts a process via the, the VAD specialist? Yeah, thanks. I think it's a very important question because if you look it up on the on the website of the Victorian Department of Health, you'll see a very oversimplified flow diagram of a patient's journey, but it's far more complex than that. Um, so I, I'll just touch on each step briefly. So I guess initially it becomes aware of this and that can be through general knowledge or um, a discussion with a family member or, or, or our previous experiences we're seeing now with people who have had, you know, a brother-in-law who have gone through voluntary assisted dying, now they're facing the same situation. And the decision to actually... Um, um, chase that themselves and that's actually a huge part and we're not capturing that part of the journey because it, it, we capture them as soon as they um, make contact. Often at that stage they might make an inquiry with their GP or they'll look online and they'll find our statewide voluntary assisted dying care navigator um, or GP often they're not trained specifically trained in voluntary assisted dying and they're encouraged to refer to the voluntary assisted dying care navigator for the state who can help them through that process. That care navigator will find a doctor, um, preferably who suits their needs. So many of these patients need a home visit because they can't attend a clinic, uh, as Peter mentioned. Um, our, our assessments, most, most of them or all of them have to be done in face-to-face. So we need two doctors who can do home visits. And in Victoria, we actually need one of those two doctors to be a specialist in the condition um, that the patient has. And I would not recommend that, that as a model um, that uh, Ireland looks at because otherwise you'll have very um, busy oncologists um, trying to, to see all of these patients um, and oncologists, um, myself excluded, uh, don't often do home visits. Um, uh, so then once they see someone, one doctor, they'll be referred on, and if they're found eligible, if they're found ineligible, they'll be stopped, the, the process stops. If they're found eligible, they'll then be referred on to a consulting doctor who has to perform an independent assessment of their eligibility against the set of criteria. Um, we promote as part of the assessment that it is VAD care provision, so it's not just assessments of eligibility. We actually ensure that the patients are linked in with palliative care um, and promote um, symptom control during those conversations as well. And often those, those conversations have been a gateway to actually get patients who have previously refused palliative care involvement to actually involve themselves in palliative care whilst they're undergoing the process. 
eligible on both of those assessments, the patient will then return to the first doctor, the coordinating medical practitioner, who then sits with them to do a written declaration of their willingness to or their wish to undergo voluntary assisted dying, which is a written application which is pre-worded for them. Um, when a patient must verbally request one more time that they wish to pursue voluntary assisted dying and then a contact person can be appointed. And that contact person is someone who's responsible for the medication. If the patient receives it and does not use it, we, I, I always tell them that we can't have that circulating in the community. So the contact person becomes legally responsible for that, the return of that medication. Um, once that's all done, then we can apply. So in Victoria, we have to apply for a special permit to uh, prescribe the individual medication to the individual each time. Um, and that can take a few days to turn around. And then we can prescribe their medication. Once that's with the single pharmacy in the state um, that does this, uh, the, it's up to the patient and their, and their contact person to contact the pharmacy and organise delivery and dispensing. Um, that's a long process. That's not just a drop-off. That can take about two hours for the, the pharmacy to go through. They do their own capacity assessments. They look at all the medications that the patients are taking. They make sure that they can ingest 30 mils of liquid in five minutes or th three minutes, I think now is the recommendation. Um, if the end of that they are uh, eligible to receive the medication, the pharmacy will then ask them if they would like the medication that day or if they'd like it a different day, because some patients don't like the medication being stored in their house. If the patient is unable to ingest or absorb that medication, we have to apply for a different permit, which is an intravenous permit. Um, and that, so that's for situations where we might have a patient with a bowel obstruction um, or disorder. Um, one of the problems that we've had is that those permits are separate and so if someone receives oral medication and then they lose their ability to swallow, we actually have to return that medication, apply for a new permit, get that new prescription done and get the new medication kit delivered. So again, talking about some of the issues that we need to evolve in Victoria, these are some of the issues that patients are facing. So an end-stage cancer patient, if they suddenly develop a bowel obstruction, they don't have that many days. Of, of not being able to eat or drink for us to get that medication process sorted and get the intravenous medication to them. Um, and then we're finally at the position where they've either got the medication, we've got the intravenous medication, and then it's completely up to the patient when, uh, who is available uh, at the time. Um, even for oral administrations, I offer all patients that I'm present at their home or in the hospital um, when they choose to take the medication. I find that useful because I can talk the family through the process and explain to them what's going on at each step of the process. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Michael, Thank Dr. Chapman just wants to come in briefly. Just okay, briefly, briefly, but I am I very, over, yeah. so very briefly, very briefly, Doctor. It was just very briefly to draw two um, differences between the New Zealand and the Australian um, processes. Um, the first is to say I think the New Zealand legislation focused very heavily and rightly on a safe service, but didn't um, build in enough about delivering a quality service to patients. And the other key difference is that all of the new medication in New Zealand is um, administered and carried by the doctor. So the doctor is solely responsible and it would never be left in a patient's home. And it's up to the doctor and the patient together to decide if oral or intravenous administration is better. And over 90% of our patients choose IV administration. Uh, so the doctor takes the medicine to the house and administers the medicine to the patient. And if they're swallowing themselves, you wait until they've finished the medicine and you wait until they've passed in the house to support the patient and their family. Thank you, thank Doctor, you. and thank you.